Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a filthy movie. And I don't mean that in the sense that it's morally bankrupt or senselessly gratuitous. I mean that it's a dirty, dirty film. As in, literally dirty and grimy and gross. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre as a movie is warm skin on a hot summer day stuck with sweat to leather car seats on a long road trip. It's gross. It's straight up stinky. Every frame of this thing looks like it smells. It's a film that makes you feel itchy just looking at it. It makes you feel like you want to take a shower after it. It yells at you three inches from your face and it almost definitely has bad breath. It's oppressive, it's dusty, it's stained, and it's perfect. It always bothers me when people do that obnoxious thing where they take an old movie with some off-colour quality and go, Ooh, this wouldn't get made today. Like, yeah, no kidding, Sherlock, because it already got made. Back then. Oh wow, shocking. A movie existed as a reflection of the culture and ideals within which it was made, and maybe some of those values that film reflects don't align with the modern perspective of the current world. The horror. It's no secret that times have changed and culture has developed in ways that elements of older flicks often age poorly when observed through the culture of today. And you know what? That's fine! If anything, it's actually historically interesting. Art is immortal, but the time in which it is made is fleeting. Isn't that a compelling paradox? A forever thing existing as a creation of a temporary time. Films and games and movies and whatever medium you want to talk about exist then not only as art and entertainment but also as historical cultural artifacts. And I don't think our changing attitudes towards these things is in any way demonstrative of some crazy push towards artistic censorship like the people who often use the wouldn't get made today line of argument think it is. And you know, the thing that always gets me about this line of thinking is that none of these people ever cite examples of the inverse, of which I assure you, there are many, especially when you look at the horror genre. Even without arguing on depictions of social issues and minority characters and asking questions like, could Moonlight have been made in the 80s? Probably not, dear reader. You can also just about cite any major R-rated horror release these days, and it looks super bad through the perspective of an audience from decades past. Ask yourself really, could Hostel have gotten made at a time period when Friday the 13th was considered controversial? Could something as graphic as The Walking Dead, a series which was at one time extremely mainstream to the point that even my horror-hating mom watched it, ever have gotten on TV then? Could Five Nights at Freddy's be considered acceptable children's entertainment at a time when horror for kids meant something closer to the tone of The Monster Squad? It's very unlikely. And yet, those things all exist now, and not even as niche underground entertainment, but as massively successful franchises with huge worldwide audiences. Times change in both ways. What might have been acceptable in the past is sketchier territory now, but equally, the inverse is also true. I mean, you can't tell me that societies now are generally more offended by media and art when 1984 gave us the video nasties moral panic, and 1993 gave us a big controversy surrounding Child's Play 3, a film that practically feels quaint by today's standards. And that's true of a lot of older horror films. While I love the practical effects of these older efforts and can appreciate why they were envelope pushing and seen as controversial and scary at the time of their release, and many do still hold up in places, there's definitely more than a few of them that come across more like a charming attempt at something edgy than being anything to get worked up by or repulsed about when compared to today's output. I have genuinely seen gorier kills more in first time student movies than in some of the stuff that caused a stir back in the 80s, at a time when horror was considered this wild and untamable genre full of loose canon creators constantly trying to one-up each other in the world of shock value. And the reason I mention all of this, other than to just counter that irritating argument that's been bugging me for ages, is because all of this actually pertains to today's topic in a very interesting way. You see, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is quite something special. It was one of the films added to the list of video nasties 
that could be seized and destroyed from distributors in Britain. It was also initially refused a cinema certificate on its release in 1975 and would not receive an official 18 certificate allowing for general theatrical release here in the UK until the 9th of April 1999. Now normally for a film to get that kind of pushback over here it's usually down to the content of the kind of assault which I'm not able to talk about on YouTube or it's down to excessive violent bloody content and yet Texas Chainsaw Massacre managed to get this reception without any of the former and almost none of the latter. It is a shockingly bloodless film, especially for something with a title like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But what's even more impressive is that while, as I've already mentioned, other films from around this period and even later that were far gorier and more gratuitous have gone on to become quaint under the scrutiny of modern sensibilities, Texas Chainsaw Massacre has not. I truly believe were this film released yesterday, it would still have the capacity to shock and terrify audiences in the same way it did nearly 40 years ago, and all without barely spilling a drop of blood in its entire runtime. How does it manage to do that? Well, that, dear friends, is what we're here to explore today. So, to bring you up to speed, if you haven't seen it, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a film that starts with an opening credit call claiming the events of the film really happened, something the marketing also pushed. But that was actually just a bold-faced lie. Thankfully, none of this is real. And although old Leatherface, our villainous slasher for the day, was inspired somewhat by the crimes of serial killer Ed Gein, the events of the film are otherwise completely fictitious. The movie begins with an instantly skin-crawling visual and sound design that immediately straps you in with an idea of just what kind of ride you're going on. The flashbulb of an old camera lighting up the image of a corpse running against a grave in the harsh Texas sunlight. Each blast of light accompanied by this truly nerve-shredding sound like nothing you've ever heard before. One that was allegedly achieved by scraping a tuning fork over a piano wire. It's so alien and shrill that even in isolation it would be enough to involuntarily stiffen your back, but when paired with the grisly imagery, the discomfort it generates will tighten your knuckles. It's explained to us that what has happened is someone has been robbing graves in the area and set up this grisly monument. News leaks out of the strange crime, and so five young individuals, Sally, Jerry, Pam, Kirk, and Sally's brother Franklin, driving by the cemetery on a road trip, make a stop in to check that Sally and her brother's grandfather's grave hasn't been desecrated in any way. Luckily, the grave is fine, but unluckily, as the group drive past a slaughterhouse, they pick up a hitchhiker, who is, uh... I think the fair term to use would be... odd? Eventually, this complete weirdo cuts Franklin before they kick him out, and even though after that encounter they'd like nothing better than to get the hell out of Dodge, an empty gas tank and an equally empty nearby gas station forces them to stick around. So the group head to Sally and Franklin's now abandoned childhood home, as two of the group, Pam and Kirk, sneak off, presumably to engage in activities the puritanical platform on which we now reside would rather I not speak of, they discover another home and wondering if they could help them out with the gas situation, Kirk has a wonder inside. Now up to this point in the movie, you're already kind of uneasy, even though technically, weird hitchhiker aside, nothing too major has happened yet. But the film has been so expertly crafted in creating this cheap, dirty feel, blasting your eyes with the dusty, dry, sweltering heat of a Texas summer, of dirty graveyards and spider-ridden dilapidated homes, of sweaty packed car interiors, stressful interactions, and a recurring motif of conversations surrounding meat and just the manufacturing of meat, the storage of meat, the butchering of meat. Big meaty man slapping meat! <laughs> All of that has made the film kind of already immerse you into just this deep unpleasantness. And now, from this point onwards, oh, it's gonna get so much worse. As Kurt makes his way through this oddly striking house with a back room covered in deep red painted walls, a color that evokes something of a sense of dark and blood, from the entrance, he hears a strange sound, a deep guttural grunting, almost like a pig in pain. Investigating, he moves to the back of the home where a series of animal heads are mounted and then trips slightly when suddenly, in one of the most visceral and shocking debuts of any horror icon ever, out pops Leatherface 
with seemingly no warning or fanfare, this snarling hulk of a man wearing a mask made from the skin of his victims and immediately he cracks Kirk in the head with a hammer. Kirk's body drops to the ground twitching but is quickly made still with another few blows to the head before our killer unceremoniously hauls Kirk into the back room and slams shut the sliding iron door behind them. The contents of that room and what happens in there now left a mystery to our imaginations. The harsh crash of a musical crescendo meeting the crash of the door, our final nail in the coffin, and the last lingering audible stamp cementing Kirk's sudden and violent demise. Before we even move on, we have to talk about how much craft is on display here. Though extremely controversial at the time and lumped in with all the trashy films of a splatty slashy era by a critical culture that maybe didn't give it a fair shake, it's very easy to see why Texas Chainsaw is now retrospectively heralded as one of the greatest horror movies of all time when you look at scenes like this. Even before we get into the discussion of themes and what the film is actively trying to do and explore beyond its violent plotting and set pieces, there's just such a sense of craft on display in every frame. You've no doubt seen a thousand movies where a big scary thing suddenly jumps out at a protagonist after a slow build-up. But it's mad to think how old Texas Chainsaw Massacre is when you consider just how fresh this particular instance of that trope still feels today. Like, let's just give it a quick breakdown and I'll explain what I mean. If you're at all familiar with mainstream modern horror, you'll know that a scene like this would usually unfold in the dark. Here, it occurs in broad daylight. Why? Well, one reason could be to create an even bigger shock. We expect things to emerge from the darkness, but the light here gives the audience at least some sense of safety. However, the noises and scenarios still do enough to create a sense of dread, so we are alert, just not necessarily in a way that makes us expect it when the shock comes. Other movies would commonly underscore this build-up with a musical cue, something like violin strings picking up in pitch in an effort to accentuate and mentally simulate a feeling of rising tension. No such score exists here, just this far more unsettling, strange squealing sound. Then we gotta talk about the exceptional set design, something that the aforementioned daytime lighting lets us see in full glory. On stepping inside, you really see the lived in wear and tear of this home, but oh, that back room, that color, doesn't it just pop out of the frame? You see this shot, and there's this almost abandoned quality to the rest of the building, but where are your eyes drawn to? This striking splash of red and skull heads. There's something very obviously unnerving about it, but it also looks just so out of place. And we pull in tighter, and tighter. There's this magnetic draw to it, a feeling that must be investigated. It's also shot in such a way that you really can't be sure of the sense of depth it has. And so when our skin fashionista does appear, it feels even more unexpected. Now let's talk about the actual attack. Kirk trips just before Leatherface appears. Why? One, it tracks our attention for a moment. We're surprised and the tension is broken by the stumble not the slasher, only for the slasher to use that distraction as a cover for his appearance. But even more importantly, it puts Kirk lower than Leatherface. And this is then accentuated through the camera work. Cut to Kirk, boom, high angle, looking down, hunched over, he's small in the frame, Leatherface's shoulder looms over him, further illustrating the sense of dominance. Then, cut to Leatherface, what do we see? Low angle, looking up, making him feel even taller. He stands up straight and raises an arm to fill even more of the frame. Where he appears in Kirk's focus shot, Kirk does not appear in leather faces. We tilt up as if raising our head to see the top of a mountain. If you actually look at the wide shot of both men in isolation for a second, it doesn't even look like there's much of a difference in height between the two. Kirk being hunched over and slightly low on the platform, he might actually even be taller if measured side by side. But the camera work and direction choices here make the difference feel astronomical. Leatherface feels like a hulking giant compared to this normal man, and the way he manhandles Kirk's body afterwards illustrates a power to match that size. You only get one first impression when introducing the character, but this might be the most effective first impression in slasher history. A truly fantastic piece of filmmaking. And of course, it's not the first brilliant use of visual storytelling in the film, and it won't be the last. I'm gonna jump around a bit now because, as you can probably guess, the plot from here 
at least for a while, is that our main group are in immediate peril from this hulking, grunting human. As one goes missing, the others search for them, only to often fall victim to the same brutality. And in that time, we get some incredible creative choices. Remember how I said this film was mostly bloodless? I actually think I can probably show you, in a fully uncut manner, one of the film's most disturbing, controversial, and sadistic kills on this platform without getting demonetized. I mean, fingers crossed that I can anyway. Hopefully the filmmaking isn't so effective that YouTube actually thinks it's gory without depicting any gore. It's pretty effective though. Maybe let's trim it just a little bit, but just a reminder, in case I can't run ads, you can donate to Trans Lifeline with the button just below. Anyway, check this out. Probably one of the most impactful look away from the screen moments in horror for like a decade after its release without spilling a single drop of blood. Leatherface gets a hold of Pam, walks her downstairs through that red room, and what do we see front and center and sharply in focus in the frame as he does so? This meat hook. Bet you can guess where this is going. We don't of course see the sharp point of this thing touch flesh, because we don't need to. Its placement at the forefront of the frame to let us know what's coming is far more effectively chilling anyway. And pair that with the image of bare skin drawing close to it, cut away and the audience's brain will do all the dirty work for you. Also, this moment comes as the knockout punch to an incredible build-up. Not five minutes earlier, we see Pam enter the house, the house where we've now just had revealed as the current residing place of a sinister killer, and we get one of my favourite shots in horror history. Absolutely brilliant in its simplicity. Just this low angle track following Pam into this building that now, to the audience, suddenly has this terrifying presence. And in this moment, through this imagery, this house feels like the most foreboding thing on the planet. The way it slowly fills the frame makes it feel like it's growing larger until it looms over its next victim, as if engulfing her in its doom. At the beginning of the shot, Pan starts as such a significant percentage of the visual on screen, and the house starts as just a smaller thing in the distance. By the end, the roles are completely reversed. The house so big that it can't even fit in the frame and Pam just a small figure in its doorway. Then we get more of that incredible, dirty, gross, filthy set design as a panicked Pam stumbles into a twisted hell of a new room we didn't see during Kirk's visit. Bone riddled living room filled with a mixture of chicken feathers, dirty bones and teeth and furniture adorned with human remains. The camera lingers and examines every grimy texture detail, the image of Pam's bare skin immersed in the piles of dirty feathers and whatever the hell else covers this wooden floor is enough to make you want to shower. It feels like a room that sits at the midpoint between that of a serial killer and an extreme hoarder. It's not just uncomfortable to look at because of its disturbed contents, it's also just that it's all so horribly cluttered and messy. It's phenomenal set design. It also leads to another of my favourite shots in horror and one of the most iconic shots in the film. Another simple one too. Pam tries to flee and Leatherface says, absolutely not mate. This one's all in the performance and timing, the absolute frantic flailing as Leatherface just unceremoniously drags her back inside. Such a compellingly frightening visual. As the film ramps up the kills, we enter into its closing act, where somehow, believe it or not, Things get far more intense. Our final girl, Sally, is the last of the group alive after her and her brother are ambushed in the dark and her brother is killed by Leatherface with a chainsaw. What happens next is one of the most intentionally, painfully drawn out chase scenes you'll ever see as Sally is pursued relentlessly by the chainsaw wielding killer for an almost agonizing five straight minutes. The entire time she's screaming, his chainsaw is roaring, and along the way in her quest to find help, she stumbles into the seemingly dead, rotting corpses of an elderly couple. It's a visual and audible assault to the senses. A noisy barrage of overstimulation you just have to endure that perfectly articulates a very real sense of terror. And this is the first of like, maybe four sequences that are just like this and ramp up in intensity to the extreme as we descend into the nightmare of the film's final moments. This first chase eventually lets up when Sally is able to run to the gas station from the start of the film to escape her pursuer. There, the friendly manager from earlier offers her some safety and comfort. But psych! 
In a sudden twist, it turns out that it's not just the individual weirdos of this wild west of a world Sally has found herself in that she has to watch out for, but the joint efforts of a whole family of them. The manager turning out to be the abusive patriarch of a cannibalistic family that includes himself, the hitchhiker from earlier, Leatherface, and a fourth that we'll get to. And as this man subdues Sally, overpowering her, tying and bagging her up and loading her into his truck, the film is keen to demonstrate the malicious joy with which he carries out cruelty. In keeping up the relentless tone, the man giggles and squeals with perverse delight as he lets himself get carried away in needlessly beating Sally with some kind of handle as he drives. And once again, even though director Toby Hooper is clever to frame this senseless act of barbarity off screen, through performance and sound design, it's still makes for an incredibly uncomfortable watch. Well that's nothing compared to the upcoming dinner scene. When Sally is taken to the family home and strapped in a chair at a dining table, in a scene that heavily inspired an early counter with the Baker family for all of you Resident Evil fans out there, we come to the culmination of all of Texas Chainsaw Massacre's most effective qualities. All of its greatest assets, its incredible set design, intelligent visuals and editing, unforgiving atmosphere, in impeccable performances all concentrate into one unrelenting burst of extreme visual intensity. The family bigger and abuse each other in raised voices as Sally screams for her freedom. Human remains decorate the chair she finds herself trapped in. Across from her sits the wheeled out, barely alive husk of a human the family called Grandpa that she encountered earlier and thought to be dead. And his corpse-like visage actually sucks her bleeding finger while his decrepit body wriggles with delight. That one's actually such a gross image. I'm gonna spare you from that one. The meat hook murder is somehow less offensive than the finger sucking. Just trust me on this. Leatherface grunts and stumbles through the home in women's clothing and makeup as if taking on the role of a put upon housewife as the gas station guy belittles and berates him. The hitchhiker bounces with glee in his seat, barely able to contain his excitement. As Sally continues to scream at the top of her lungs, the family mock and belittle her, howling along with her cries. Editing ramps up, the cuts become faster, the screams louder. Sally's grimace of horror juxtaposed by close ups of perverse delight in her captors. A lamp made of human faces lights the table. Leatherface and the hitchhiker prod and pork with curiosity at their new victim. They play with her hair, dirty hands are rubbed in her face, and as they continue to belittle and mock her, the framing gets tighter and tighter until all we're seeing is the wide-eyed bloodshot panic of Sally's eyes in frantic flashes as screams and howls and mockery and noise and a soundtrack that can only be described as hell on vinyl fill the audio tracks. It is a lot. Without gore, without jump scares, this film creates a scene that is truly visible and heart pounding. It is overstimulation in movie form, a perfect communication of abject terror. It's horrible. That's what makes it so good. It is pure craftsmanship. It feels like you are losing your mind. It is not easy to make something this unnerving this unrelenting, and this uncomfortable without resorting to cheap shock tactics, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre, all the way back in 1974, created something here that still evokes a vivid sensation of dread and paranoia and this primal, unhinged fear. Nearly 50 years after its release, it still makes me squirm in my seat. And it gets even better. We still have another uncomfortable and unrelenting finale to go, but this next section plays out a little differently to the others. The family try to get Grandpa involved in Sally's killing, but his grip is too weak to deliver a fatal blow. So Sally finds a chance to escape, literally throwing herself through a window in desperation. Her beaten, slashed body limps away as Leatherface and the hitchhiker continue to pursue and attack her. In a stroke of luck, and not without initial failure, Sally, bloodied and broken, is finally finally able to be saved, hitching a ride in the back of a pickup truck which drives off and this is it. The ending that makes everything click into place. That makes everything the film has put you through. That's made the actual endurance test of noise and visual assault all worth it. You know how I keep pointing the things throughout this video and saying, one of my favourite shots? Well here is my out and out favourite shot in horror history. Not one of, the favourite. Sally, in the back of a truck, drenched in blood, injured, 
psychologically messed up the hell. Everything she has been through visually painted onto her character looks back at her would-be killer and laughs as she drives off into the sunset as Leatherface just swings his chainsaw wildly. Perhaps in anger, perhaps in frustration, perhaps in pure confusion of having all this energy and nowhere to put it on, not knowing what to do next, he just flails. The rev of the chainsaw blasting the nothing in particular as his silhouette almost beautifully dances in the orange glow of the Texas sun. I mean, it's bloody good, isn't it? Now look, there's a lot of themes in this movie that this video is running so long now, I won't get to fully explore. Toby Hooper and co-writer Kim Henkel really wanted to comment on the idea of contemporary American life at the time. The idea of the aspirational nuclear family is perverted through the killers. Leatherface dressed like a woman takes on the role of the American housewife, beaten, berated, and abused by the father figure of the cook from the gas station. The hitchhiker becomes a rebellious teenager, blowing raspberries and kicking cars, and the whole family sits in respect of an old, yet objectively powerless patriarch. The film emanates a kind of disillusionment with the American system that pervaded culture following the Vietnam War. It decorates its world with bad news stories on the radio, fills its scenes with desecrated institutions like that of its graveyard. It heavily alludes to disenchantment and unemployment with the drunk in the graveyard and the hitchhiker stories of the slaughterhouses closing down and letting people go as the technology they used became quicker and easier. The film is also, intentionally or not, kind of a vegetarian movie. I remember the first time I watched it being shocked that I'd never heard this sentiment before when so much of the film is about visualising the body as meat. The villains are kooks and cannibals. Besides the chainsaw, characters fall victim to what looks like a meat tenderizer and are chopped up post-death and kept in freezers like food. The topic of slaughterhouses and the slaughtering of cows is discussed in graphic detail as a precursor to all of the violence. Almost like an intentional foreshadowing and parallel is being drawn. And let's not forget, one of the most iconic moments of the whole movie sees a woman literally suspended from a kitchen meat hoop. I immediately looked online after first watching the film to see if anyone else had drawn such a conclusion. And apparently, I'm not the only one, as this film is actually credited as being the primary reason for director Guillermo del Toro choosing to go vegetarian. Fun fact. But for me personally, while it is all that and more, my biggest takeaway from the movie lies entirely in that penultimate shot, with the bloodied Sally escaping in laughter from the trauma she just endured. And yeah, logically, you can read from the scene and performance that the laughter is spurred on by a form of mania, a last ditch outburst from a brain so broken, it doesn't even know what to do anymore. And I think maybe plot wise, that might be what's happening here. But in more metaphorical narrative sense, I choose to see it as defiance. As Sally wears the entire history of the film all over her body, as we come out of such truly relentless back-to-back -back visuals, as we finally leave this grimy, filthy, violent world, Sally laughs in a way that feels definitively earned. And it kind of encapsulates everything I love about the horror genre. You see, this woman has been through hell and back. But in the end, she still beats it. That's the joy of this genre for me. It's an exorcism of the worst the world can offer, a light at the end of the darkness, an illustration of the idea that no matter how bad things get, and they will get bad, you can keep going, you can keep fighting. And though you might come out the other end bloodstained, battered, and broken, you can laugh because you beat it. Ain't that something special? And on that note, thanks again for watching. This video is already probably way too long and you know, there's still like a crap ton of these to do. So I'll just say, you know what to do. Subscribe to my only dance, put on notifications, donate to Trans Lifeline and in non-Trans Lifeline charity related endeavors. Please vote for me on Face of Horror and check out the 10% discount code for the new In Search of Darkness I got for being a credit advisor on the film. How cool is that? All that and more in the description below. You get the gist. See you tomorrow, Dramblers. Bollocks, I just said that unironically. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> just, just end it there. <laughs> <laughs>